What an excellent day for an exorcism. Forgive us, Father, for we are about to explore sin, or rather possession, and the cinematic influence of Satan himself. In 1973, the world was subjected to a film that would go down as one of the scariest ever made, The Exorcist. It explored the corruption of innocence and defilement of the human soul, and would make history as the first horror film nominated for an Academy Award. Ten of them, in fact, two of which it won. But with the highs came the lows, and the tragedies, and the curses. Today, we're exploring all of that on this episode of Production Tales from Hell. Hey everyone, it's your twisted woman here, Chauncey K. Robinson, and welcome to Production Tales from Hell, where we dive into all the fire and brimstone it took to make the horror films we know and love, and in some cases, the darkness that followed their releases. In this episode, we'll be focusing on one of the most controversial films of its time, 1973's The Exorcist. There are five circles of film hell, development, production, post-production, distribution, and perhaps the most dreaded, Limbo. The Exorcist developed under the guise of real demonic circumstances, featured chaos and physical harm during production, and has a distribution story filled with vomit, lawsuits, protest, and danger. The movie not only got in bed with the devil, but stayed there with it under the covers. We'll dive into all those hellish details in a minute. But first, I want to thank our partner, WeTransfer. WeTransfer believes creativity drives humankind, so they aim to serve the creative community, making them the perfect solution for preventing your own production hell. Picture this, you've been working day and night on your magnum opus, the next great indie film. Ty West would be proud. You're putting the finishing touches on the final edit just in time for your big festival premiere. When disaster strikes, a massive fire destroys your house. Good news and bad news. Your family's okay. Your computer and all its files, less so. Of course, your team has backups, but they're all over the country and there are terabytes of files. Don't worry, this can all be solved with WeTransfer. WeTransfer specializes in sharing large files all over the world and is designed to work for individuals and teams. So you'll be able to gather everything you need from your team, password protected, and make sure you're festival ready before disaster can strike again. And we trust WeTransfer so much, we're using it to deliver exclusive bonus content to you. Go to the link in our description to access a commentary track with me, James, and Chelsea for each of the movies we've covered on Production Tales, as well as a zine featuring exclusive art. The Exorcist is a supernatural horror film based on the novel of the same name, which was based on a supposedly true story. More on that later. The movie tells the story of a young girl named Reagan who becomes possessed by a demon named Pazuzu. In a fight for Reagan's soul, her mother, movie star Chris McNeil, enlists the help of two priests. Catholic priest Lancaster Marin has seen his share of otherworldly things, while the younger father, Damien Karras, has come to question his faith. Starring Ellen Burstyn, Jason Miller, Linda Blair, Max von Sydow, and Lee J. Cobb. The Exorcist was directed by the late William Friedkin and written by William Peter Blatty, who also wrote the novel the movie is based upon. The Exorcist would go on to be a box office hit, scaring plenty of moviegoers around the world. It remains one of Warner Brothers' top 100 grossing films of all time. If only this show was about horror movies that overcame the odds and became super successful. It's not, though. At the heart of The Exorcist is a real story about a little boy possessed by a demon. It is one hell of a foundation to build a movie on, or a novel for that matter. By the time writer William Peter Blatty wrote The Exorcist, he was already an established comedic author. But he couldn't stop thinking about something he had read about nearly 20 years prior when he was at Georgetown University. In 1949, during his junior year of college, Blatty, a devout Catholic, read a story in the Washington Post. It was about a 14-year-old boy named Roland Dove, later revealed to be Ronald Edwin Hunkler, who was allegedly the victim of demonic possession. 
Blatty wanted the story to be the nucleus for his next book, but kept meeting dead ends when it came to actual evidence that could support the story. And if he didn't have the conviction that the story was real, he didn't want to write it at all. His breakthrough came in the form of the diary of one of the priests who had attended the exorcism of Doe. Blatty found the detailed and meticulous account to be beyond a doubt convincing and thus proceeded with the book. And then, as in many Hollywood stories, the best-selling book was optioned into a movie just two years later. Before production could begin, they needed the perfect cast and director. This would prove to be its own kind of hell. When it came to his novel, Blatty had made minor changes to the allegedly factual story. He made the possessed victim younger and changed the gender from a boy to a girl. The priests were given their own backstories, and the young girl's mother was turned into a movie star. For these parts and others, the studio wanted big name stars. They also wanted to pick the director. Arthur Penn, Stanley Kubrick, and Mike Nichols were all offered the job, but they all turned it down for various reasons. Eventually, Mark Rydell was signed on as director, but writer Blatty wanted someone else. He wanted William Friedkin. Although the studio initially scoffed at the idea, in the end, they backed down and Friedkin was brought aboard. After that, the hunt for the cast began. In Friedkin's 2013 memoir, The Friedkin Connection, the director goes into detail about his casting struggles. Originally, for the role of movie star and mother, Chris McNeil, the studio had in mind Audrey Hepburn, Anne Bancroft, or Jane Fonda. Friedkin explains that he and Blatty were both fine with Hepburn. The actress reacted favorably to the offer, but would require them to shoot in Rome, since that's where she was living at the time. Friedkin said that that would be too difficult and asked her to reconsider, but she declined. And so there would be no exorcism at Tiffany's. I'll see myself out. Anne Bancroft was next in line and was also interested in the role, but asked that filming be pushed back a year since she was pregnant. Friedkin and Blatty said no. Then came perhaps the most prolific rebuff from the badass Jane Fonda. After Fonda read the script, Friedkin says she sent a telegram stating, Why would anyone want to make this piece of capitalist ripoff bullshit? We love a queen who tells us how she really feels, okay? Fonda would later clarify to Friedkin that she didn't want to do the film because she didn't believe in magic. Ellen Burstyn, who would eventually nab the role, was at first a hard sell to both the studio and Friedkin, but she was her own strongest advocate, calling the director and telling him that playing Chris McNeil was her destiny. When Friedkin brought up Burstyn to Ted Ashley, the chairman of Warner Brothers Studio, Ashley was vehemently against the idea. According to Friedkin, Ashley fumed in his office and furiously yelled, I'm not giving the lead in this picture to a woman who's never played a lead in anything. Ellen Burstyn will play this part over my dead body. Fortunately for Burstyn, the studio had no other choices and eventually approved her. When it came to casting father Lancaster Marin, the studio wanted Marlon Brando. Friedkin was immediately against this idea because he didn't want it to become a Brando movie. The role would instead go to Swedish actor Max von Sydow. For father Damien Karras, Jack Nicholson, Paul Newman, and Roy Scheider were all considered. Blatty ended up hiring Stacy Keach, who signed a contract and everything but fate would intervene and give us a different actor in the part. Friedkin came across Jason Miller in New York when the actor was performing in a play called That Championship Season. He thought the actor might be good for the part of Father Karras, but their initial meeting didn't go well and production moved on. Sometime later, Friedkin received a call from Miller that he detailed in his memoir. I read that book you told me about, that exorcist, that guy is me. What guy? Father Karras. Oh, well, I appreciate your interest, but we've signed an actor. <laughs> well, I'm telling you I am that guy. Will you at least shoot a screen test with me? No, no, we've cast the role. I don't care. You don't care? Friedkin, impressed with Miller's boldness, gave him a screen test, and he got the part. That took guts. With many of the other roles filled, it came time to cast the pivotal part of Reagan, the possessed young girl at the center of the story. For over four months, Friedkin, Blatty, and company auditioned a thousand girls. They even increased the age of the character in hopes of finding the right young actress who would be able to handle such a grueling role. A 13-year-old Jamie Lee Curtis was considered, but her mother, famed actress Janet Lee, said no. One day, Linda Blair's mother showed up to Friedkin's office without an appointment, hoping the director would meet with her daughter. According to Friedkin, Blair seemed unperturbed about the movie's material and what her character had to do. 
That was good enough for him. They had found their Reagan. It wasn't just the script that had demonic forces and injuries. The set had plenty of that stuff too. By the time they began filming in 1972, Friedkin had developed a reputation of pushing his actors to their limits. The Exorcist proved to be no different. In a short behind the scenes documentary about the film by Owen Roisman, who was the lead cinematographer on The Exorcist, it was shown that Friedkin had a few unorthodox ways of getting the reactions he wanted from his stars. Often, without warning, the director would shoot off guns on set to evoke startled reactions. Friedkin would later claim he was inspired by director George Stevens. While filming the 1959 Oscar-winning film, The Diary of Anne Frank, Stevens regularly shot pistols to get his crew into the nerve-wracked state he desired. Quite the movie to pull that shit on. As for Friedkin, one time, he wanted to get a particular emotion from the late father, William O'Malley, who played Father Dreyer in the film. His director's toolbox must have run out because he resorted to slapping the actor across the face without warning and then rolling film on the cameras. The abuse didn't stop there either. During the scene where Reagan slaps her mother, Burstyn complained that she was getting pulled across the room too hard by special effects supervisor, Marcel Vakuter. Friedkin told the actress he would have it fixed, but instead encouraged Vakuter to pull Burstyn harder. The actress was yanked violently across the room, landed on her tailbone, and screamed in real pain. This was the shot that Friedkin used in the movie. The actress was left on crutches for the rest of production. Although Friedkin would dispute Burstyn's claim that she was badly injured, it's no wonder that Burstyn would go on to say in a later interview that Friedkin was a maniac and that the actions he took were beyond what anyone needs to do to make a movie. In fact, there were many firings and resignations of crew members who didn't care for Friedkin's tactics. One of those tactics was keeping the set refrigerated to see the character's breath during the exorcism. Temperatures could go well below freezing. And while the crew wore heavy coats and hats, young Linda Blair was left in nothing but the thin nightgown she wears in the movie. When it came to Blair's makeup, the actress would later recall that the glue they used to put on the prosthetics burned her skin. If freezing temps and skin burns weren't bad enough, the young actress was also severely injured while on set. During the exorcism scenes, Blair was strapped into a harness so she could be jerked around violently. In one incident, the straps came loose from the harness and the young actress was thrashed about so violently that she ended up fracturing her lower spine. Once again, the footage in which this accident occurred was used in the film. Blair and Burstyn ended up with chronic back pain that still affects them today. On top of all of this, the cast and crew were convinced that the set was haunted, for good reason. During production, a number of the cast, including Linda Blair and Max von Sydow, lost family members. Also, the son of Jason Miller had a near-fatal motorcycle accident during filming. At one point, the entire set of the McNeil household caught on fire, except the room belonging to the demon-possessed Reagan, for some reason. The fire delayed filming for six weeks and was seen as such a bad omen, a priest was asked to bless the set. Despite the grueling production, filming eventually wrapped and The Exorcist was released onto the world. And the world was not ready. Initially, the studio had little faith in the film and they only gave it a limited theatrical release. But soon, large lines began to grow outside of the theater showing it and Warner Brothers decided to give it a wider release. As the film's success began to rise, so did the controversy. Some critics felt that the movie should be rated X instead of R. Conspiracy theories were spread that the Motion Pictures Association of America's rating board had given into pressure by the studio to give the film an R rating. Although there is no evidence to prove this occurred. In Mississippi and the United Kingdom, there were protests to have the film banned from being shown. Barf bags were given out during screenings due to the high volume of audience members who became physically ill while watching the movie. Allegedly, one woman passed out and broke her jaw while watching. She then proceeded to sue Warner Brothers, claiming it was the film's subliminal messages that caused her to faint and injure herself. It was a wild claim, but WB settled out of court with her to avoid a trial. Then you had Linda Blair at the center of it all, and not everyone was kind to the young actress. For six months after the release of The Exorcist, the studio had to hire bodyguards for Blair due to the death threats she received from religious zealots who felt that her portrayal of Reagan glorified Satan. 
In a 2016 interview with OWN Magazine, Blair explained how challenging that time in her life was. She said, The Exorcist was so controversial, so of course I am at the very pinnacle of all that, so it all became my fault. The Exorcist made horror history, but that notoriety came with a price. In addition to its chaotic production, a curse supposedly followed it. Shortly after filming Wrapped, Jack McGowan, who played the film director Burke Dennings, died in real life from complications with influenza. Vasiliki Maliaros, who played Father Karras' mother, passed away before The Exorcist hit the big screen. If that wasn't creepy enough, it turns out one of the actors in the film ended up being a real-life convicted murderer. I'm talking about Paul Bateson. He appeared as a radiology technician in perhaps one of the most realistic scenes in the movie, dealing with the medical test Reagan had to go through as her possession progressed. In September 1977, four years after The Exorcist, a man named Addison Verrill was found beaten and stabbed to death in his Greenwich Village apartment. Verrill had been a reporter for Variety and also an out gay man. When his murder received little to no national press, a reporter from the publication The Village Voice, Arthur Bell, called out media's lack of concern for the safety of those in the gay community. After publishing his article, he supposedly received a call from an anonymous person claiming to have killed Beryl. Paul Bateson was eventually brought in for the murder. Bateson denied the killings, but the evidence was against him, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. There were reports that while in prison, Bateson confessed to more murders of gay men, but no further charges were brought against him due to the lack of evidence. Was he a serial killer? We may never know. Bateson was released from prison in 2003 after nearly 24 years. Since that time, his whereabouts are unknown. Cursed film or just unbelievably creepy coincidences? Perhaps, as some have argued, the studio played into the creepy controversy in order to gain more attention for the film. No matter the case, the hype is justified because The Exorcist holds real substance and cultural importance. It made mainstream film organizations take horror movies a bit more seriously, and the material and topic still resonates with many today, half a century later. The Exorcist seemed like hell to make, and dealt with literal hell on top of it. The results are a pretty iconic movie. I'm Chauncey K. Robinson, and this has been Production Tales from Hell. Stay creepy out there.